let's uh, read one verse. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So friends, the Lord Jesus Christ revealed his role in coming here on earth. He is the beloved Son of God, the only Son of God. And He came not to be served. Yes, He said in John chapter 13 that He is rightly called teacher and Lord. But though He is a teacher, though He is a Lord to us, He came not to be served, but to serve. So when he came to, to, to serve here, he did not come to serve the way that we are serving, friends. Because he said further that to give his life as a ransom for many. So we got to try to understand this today. Now friends, he said this because the setting then when he was saying these words is that there was a struggle among the disciples. They want to beat each other. They want to be ahead of one another. They want to be ahead. They don't want to be detailed. So they want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. That was the setting here. Because James and John, they were asking Jesus in verse 35, Teacher, they said, we want you to do us whatever we ask. So he, they said that we want a favor. And what do you want? me to do for you, Jesus said. And they said, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. And how many of, among us friends would like to have that position in life where we shall be the left hand, we shall be at the left hand or the right hand of God the Father or the Lord Jesus Christ or your boss at work. See, there is this always a struggle for for greatness. We want to be the greatest at work. We want to be the greatest in the church. We want to be the greatest in the country. Well known. But Jesus said that if you want to be the greatest, he said in verse 42, you know that those who regarded, who you regarded as rulers of uh, as rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. And verse 43, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first must be your slave, must be a slave of all. So it's not just a slave of one, but all. So friends, this is how the Lord Jesus Christ is, uh, tries to, uh, uh, to change our mindset. Because the mindset of man is that if you want to be the greatest, then lord it over them. Rule over them. But he said that if you want to be the greatest, then serve them. Then be their slave. Because those are the ones that will lift you up. But if you try to lift yourself up, then you have an enemy, in a sense. Because the Lord said that he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the, the humble. And so here comes the Lord Jesus Christ now saying that, you know, when I came, I did not come to lord it over you the way that you, th you think lordship. When I said that I am Lord, then I set an example for you as Lord because you will be following in my footstep. That's why in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came here, when he was teaching, he, was, he did not just teach with his words. He taught with his life. He impacted lives of people because of the way that he lived. And that is how the Lord wants us to live our lives, friends. We have to be a good example uh, to others so that we shall be the head and not the tail because you know what an example? An example is a forerunner. An example is a head. 
If I want to show you something, should I not be the first to do it? So if you want to be the head, then be the slave, serve others. So Jesus is saying here, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And so in John chapter 13, this is how he showed his service. And we are very familiar with this. In fact, in verse uh, 1 of uh, John chapter 13, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time has come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So this was before Jesus was turned over to be crucified. Now we are told, friends, that now is the time for him to show the extent of his love. What is the extent of your love? How much do you love your brother? How much do you love your sister? How much do you love the Lord? Do you serve the Lord? We are talking about service here. Do you serve the Lord when you feel like wanting it? You just want to serve the Lord because they get nothing to do. It's out of our convenience. We don't want to go out of our comfort zone. We just want to serve the Lord when everything is fine. But how about if someone is opposing you? Someone has just uh, said something about you that you didn't want. How do you respond to those things? Will, will you continue to serve the Lord? What is the extent of your love for the Lord? Remember, when we are serving, we are not serving men. We are serving the Lord. And if we are serving the Lord, are we to be affected, friends, by people around us? Or should we just focus our eyes on Him, being our Lord and our Master? In your job, take, take your job as an example. You have co-workers. They are mean to you. But your boss is not mean to you. How do you serve your boss? You still give your best even if your co-workers are mean to you? They come against you as a group and yet you got the favor of your boss. Are you to be affected, friends, by what they are doing here? Or should your service be focused on God or on your boss and you still get the favor of your boss? See, many times, friends, we are serving God not the way that we are serving our, me, our, our earthly our masters because we live a double standard life. There is a life that we live in the church or in the kingdom of God and there is a life that we live outside of the church or in the world. In the world, we are willing to sacrifice, friends. We are willing to sacrifice. People curse at you. You don't really care. People are opposing you at work. You don't care. You still go to work. They hate you at work. As if they don't, they don't really want you to be there. You, you could feel it, friends, by the way that they speak to you, the way that they deal with you. They just don't want you to be there. But still, you go to work. Still, you are not affected by anything because you said that, you know, but my boss likes me. Because you receive a favor from your boss. But how about in the church? In the church, how do we serve the Lord in the church? Again, there are co-workers, brothers and sisters in the Lord. They are mean to you. As if they don't want you to be there. And everything else that you hear about you is negative. But you know that God that you're serving favors you. Are you still going to church? Are, we, are you still going to serve the Lord the way that you are serving your earthly master? See the double standard here? Many times, friends, we quit the church. Many times we move out of the church because we are living a double standard life. And Jesus is setting an example here. Say that they come against me, they have a plan, and yet now I'm about to 
show them the extent of my love. And he set this example through the washing of the apostles' feet. Again, who would like to wash the apostles' feet? Who would you be willing to stoop down and serve the lowliest among the brothers and among the sisters? Are you willing to stoop down and just wash their feet? Meantime, they are looking down at you. Are you willing? And that's what Jesus had done. He said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. So he said that I am willing to lay down my life, but how can I show you that even today I am willing to lay down my life? How can I show you? It's easy, friends, to say, I am willing to lay down my life for you. Because the time has not yet come for you to really give up your life. Well, if you are not willing to wash the apostles' feet, if you are not willing to wash even your brother's feet, and you say that you are willing to lay down your life, are we willing to lay down our lives for a brother or a sister? See, if we are not even willing to do that, how can we say that we, the extent of our love is that I am willing to die for a brother? That's why in John chapter uh, 15, verse 13, greater love has no man than this, than for that man to lay down his life for his brother. See, laying down our lives, friends, again, last time we talked about it, it's not easy. But Jesus showed it to us. This is how you serve. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that when Jesus came, friends, he set an example because many times the problem is attitude. Attitude. The problem, friends, attitude. So if Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, He said that your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So if the problem is attitude, then he came to set a good example as far as attitude is concerned. Uh, remember, friends, last time we talked about attitude, attitude, altitude, and aptitude. What is attitude? That is you, the character you have inward. What is altitude? The height. How far do you want or how high do you want to be? And how about aptitude? The mind. What you know. So we said last time that it is the attitude, not the aptitude that determines your altitude. Again, it is not your aptitude. Uh, it is your attitude, not your aptitude, that determines your altitude. So, what we mean, friends, is that it's not because you are the brightest, you are the most skilled, that you are the most experienced, that you will get the highest position in your job, in your workplace. No. It's not your aptitude. But it is your attitude. How are you serving in the company? How are you dealing with people in the company that determines whether you will be promoted or not? Because there are a lot of people that have the aptitude, but they don't have the attitude. They have a bad attitude. And so even if they are the brightest, the best worker, if they don't have the right attitude, they will not get to where they want to be, the altitude that they want. So your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. What is nothing? Nothing is nada. Nothing. Amen. 
He made himself nothing, nobody. Taking the very nature of a, a servant. Friends, he's the son of God. He came down. He made himself nothing. And he took the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is the attitude of the Lord. You want to be the greatest? Have this attitude. Amen. He came down to serve. And because he came down taking the very nature of a servant, very appearance of a man, he laid down his life. And because of that, friends, he is now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He got the altitude. He got to the position, friends, where praises and glories are being offered to him today because he came down as, as a lowly man serving us, yielding his life for us, and dying for us in humility and in obedience uh, to God the Father. And so, friends, this is what Jesus had done. And then he said that he came as a, a ransom for many. What is a ransom? Well, something that you, you pay for life. And more especially during those times, a ransom is the amount that you pay to set a slave free. See, if someone is in slavery, you pay them the ransom, the money. And we are told, friends, that he came to offer himself as a ransom. He did not come, friends, with tons and loads of silver and gold. He came with his own body. You know why? Psalm 49 tells us that no amount from verse 7 no man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him the ransom for life is costly no payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay so we are told, friends, that no man can redeem the life of another. I cannot save you, friends. Let me tell you, I cannot save you. No man can redeem the life of another. Not all of us can save one man. No. Because the ransom for life is costly. No amount is ever enough. Not one million, not one billion, not one trillion. No. No amount is enough to pay for life. That's why the most precious gift that we've ever received from God is life itself. Life itself, friends. You cannot buy your life. You cannot extend your life even for a minute. No way. Only God can give that to us as his gift. Amen. That's why you treasure your life. You treasure your life. While you have that life, serve the Lord who gave you that life. And he who gave you that life will redeem you through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the only redemption, friends, for life is the blood of Jesus. No ransom is enough to pay for the life of someone. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he said that I came not to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Not all. It is available to all but not all took that opportunity 
That's why he said that just for many. See, in 1 Timothy 2.6, we are told that it's for all. But who responded? Not all responded. He said here, from verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And so this is the Apostle Paul talking now, saying that, you know, he's given to us as a ransom for all, but Jesus said that many are called, but few are chosen. So not all had been redeemed, friends, only those who are few that willingly serve the Lord, willingly surrender their life to him that are saved. So let us appreciate what he had done. And as far as we're concerned, friends, he said that I have set you an example that you may follow in my footsteps. So everything that the Lord had done, friends, is for us to follow. See, it is not words that matters. It's the deeds that matter. What are we doing with the words that we have received from the Lord? So this, this week, there will be a lot of celebration. There will be a lot of commemoration happening but how shall we respond to those? We have the Good Friday. Well, of course, there is a dispute whether it's a Friday or Thursday that he was crucified. But what's good in that Friday? What's good in it? Is there anything good in that day? What do you think? What's good on that day? Is that the day the day that Jesus was crucified? Is that the day that Jesus was beaten? He was bruised. He suffered that day. Is it not that day that the Lord had to suffer? So what's good in it? What's good in it? Is there anything good in that? Friends, that's why even maybe that that we can also reflect on what uh, this guy said. Uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, what did he say about the Lord Jesus Christ? Chapter 2. Oh, no, chapter 1. He said, chapter 1 of John. Oh, okay. Uh, there, there, there are many books in the Bible. Chapter 1 of John, verse 46. Well, let's read from verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is no nothing false. So, is there anything good that can come out of Nazareth? That was the question. They were talking about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Is there anything? Thing good that can come out of Nazareth? Well, friends, that Good Friday, something good came out of Nazareth. That's why they call it good, a holy Friday. You know why? What's good in it? What's good in that Good Friday? Friends, that, is, that was the day when Jesus died on the cross. That was the day when he fulfilled what he said here. I came to 
give or to pay the ransom for many. He ransomed us through his death on the cross. And so the thing that is good about that Friday is that it was that Friday, friends, when Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin and my sin. Amen. And it calls for a celebration. It calls for a celebration. Many times, friends, we, we celebrate in a very solemn manner. Don't do this and do that. Don't eat this and don't drink that. Friends, Good Friday calls for a great celebration because that is the day of our deliverance. A day when we were set free from the bondage of sin. See, we were in slavery. And for us to be set free from slavery, somebody has to pay the ransom for us to be set free from slavery. And it's on that day that Jesus paid the ransom and we have been set free from the slavery of sin because sin had been swallowed up in victory through the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross on that good Friday. Amen. That's why, friends, we have to appreciate now celebrate it, reflecting on the goodness of the Lord to you. How much love do you have for the Lord? Are you willing to lay down your life to serve the Lord? Are you willing to lay down? You want to be the head. How can you be the head? Serve the Lord. Amen. And so friends, this, this week, let's uh, come together as a family. We don't have a service. The next service will be Sunday. Because we shall celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. But during this week, as the world celebrates, as the world remember what Jesus had done, as a family, gather your family and just have a good reflection of what the Lord had done in your own personal lives. Forget the lives of others. This is a time for us to have a self-reflection. The Lord loved us so much. He gave his only begotten son. Jesus loved us so much, he yielded his own life for us. We are so helpless and hopeless, and yet he gave us a ransom for that hopelessness and helplessness, and we have been set free. So friends, spend your time together as a family. Study scripture as a family. Thank God for what he had done in your life so far, because we know that greater things are yet to come. Amen. Greater things are yet to come, friends. You have not seen anything yet. You have not seen anything yet. This is just the beginning of good things. See, if you think that you have everything now, forget it. You have not seen anything yet. And that is our motivation, friends, to press on and press on. Because we have not seen everything yet. This is just a foretaste of what God has in store for us. See all the tra tra problems and troubles that comes with what we have today? We are told that gifts that we receive from God, he adds no sorrow to it. But how many times we have sorrow over the gifts that we already have? How many times you have a problem, say, oh, I got the best job, the best paying job, but you have sorrow. You've got a lot of problems. You encounter a lot of problems in your job. Oh, I got the big house, but you got a problem. Oh, I got a good family, but you got a problem. He said that there is nothing. He adds no sorrow to the best that he will give you. So for as long as we have all this, we have not seen anything yet, friend. This is just a foretaste. And if we prove ourselves to be faithful in these small things, then he will give us bigger things. Amen. But we got to be faithfully serving him. When we serve friends, we are not serving men. Amen. When we serve, we are not serving because I'm here. The leaders are here. Even if all the leaders are not here, we are here. Amen. Because we are serving God. 
When we come here, we come not to meet men. We come to meet the Lord. And it is here, friends, the moment that you step in here, that say, God, speak to me. I am listening. And may the Lord just open your hearts, friends. Open your mind. And just bless you with what you have heard today. And let us serve him the way that Jesus served. So that you want to be the greatest. Do what I've done. Do what I've done. Amen. I did not come to be served. I came to serve. If that is our attitude, all things will go well. If our attitude, friends, is that we came to be served, you know, the moment that someone does not serve you, you're down. Because your expectation is people will serve you. Right? But if your attitude is you came to serve and nobody served you, it's fine because you never expected it anyway. Amen. And then God will give you the opportunity to serve and they lift you up and God is glorified. Let's stand up. Let's pray.